Our passage this morning comes from the book of Philippians, and we're going to be in chapter 2, verses 12 through 30. It's a pretty long section of scripture, so obviously we're not going to be able to cover everything. We'll have to focus on some parts more than others. But I would invite and encourage, uh, if you're able to stay for the adult Sunday school, which we will have after this, it will be an opportunity for us to talk together so that we could work through some of the application of the sermon uh, together so we can learn from one another. Our sermon this morning is found on page 952 of your Pew Bibles. So as I was thinking, even as the kids were here, when was the last time you sort of allowed yourself, for the lack of a better word, to act like a child? In, in the sense of where you really just didn't seem to care how other people saw you. Now, I, I know that, you know, that's not something that children automatically, you know, they don't care what anybody thinks. We know kids can be sensitive as well. But there's a, 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 like an innocence that happens when you're younger and you can f kind of, for the lack of a better word, lose yourself in the fun that you're having and doing whatever it is. I was thinking about um, a pinata. If you guys know what a pinata is, it's usually like a paper mache animal that is filled with candy and they have them at children's birthday parties and they hang them from a ceiling and the objective is for the person who is blindfolded, usually blindfolded, because if you're not blindfolded, it takes away the fun, usually a blindfolded person to swing at where they think the pinata is and when they hit it, all the candy spills out. Now, part of the fun of that is that, you know, the person is blindfolded, so they can't sing. And so, you know, part of the, the jokes, the, the laughter that comes is just seeing this person who looks kind of silly, kind of ridiculous because they're swinging and they're totally missing it. Oh, if they could only take off their blindfold, they realize that they're even facing the wrong direction. Now, ideally, what happens when you, when you play, uh, you know, something like the pinata, even the person who is blindfolded is laughing and having a fun time too because they know that the people aren't actually laughing at them. They're just sort of laughing at the ridiculous situation. And I think that as adults, it's really hard for us to sort of be able to lose ourselves to where we're able to, um, for the lack of a better word, swing wildly at the air, feel, sometimes feeling blindfolded, and being okay to realize, like, we're in on the joke, too. As adults, we oftentimes are so concerned about other people's opinion and how do I come across that, in many ways, we lose that childlike innocence. Now, at a party, you know, adults can play pinata and, you know, they have fun. But I think, overall, as adults, we tend to button ourselves up pretty pretty quickly and lose that, that childlike wonder and innocence. And I was thinking about a pinata specifically because our text this morning is like a pinata, a pinata full of Old Testament imagery. Because as you may notice in your bulletins, there is the story of the Old Testament that is laid out so that you can see how what the Apostle Paul is writing is full of Old Testament imagery about God being faithful to his people, as well as God's promise to fix what is wrong in this world through his people and ultimately through his king. Now, sometimes what happens is that we remove ourselves from that story. And as we go on in the sermon, we'll be able to figure out maybe why that is, or maybe sort of the, the unconscious or subliminal messages that we hear, like the Old Testament isn't for us, what matters is going to heaven. But the reason why the Apostle Paul does this is because he wants everybody to, everywhere at all times whether you're from the nation of Israel or whether you are outside of the nation of Israel, Gentiles, 
people who are not part of ethnic Israel, to know that you are part of God's story through faith in Jesus. So as we go into the passage this morning, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we know that so often as adults, we, we button ourselves up. We're very concerned about public opinion, how we come across, that in many ways we are incapable or really, really hesitant to able, be able to lose ourselves in childlike excitement. Help us then, even as we see this passage this morning, to see what it looks like for us to be your children, excited about the things that you are doing in this world to fix what is wrong, and also so that we may follow you, we may obey you, not as begrudging servants, but as happy children. Amen. So our sermon this morning is picking up from where we were last week. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 30. The Apostle Paul, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, has been laying out this charge for followers of Jesus in Philippi. And if you, didn't know, if you don't know where Philippi is, it's kind of in, in, in southern eastern Greece. And it was a Roman colony, which meant that Rome was in charge. And so many people were proud of their Roman citizenship. But the Apostle Paul, all throughout Philippians, says, listen, even though you may be a Roman citizen or you are living in Roman-occupied territory, ultimately you are a citizen of a different kingdom. You are citizens of God's kingdom. And so therefore, live a worthy <coughs> life. Act like you are a citizen of God's kingdom. And so he continues on in this morning to share with us what it looks like to live a worthy life. It says, Therefore, my dear brothers, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. If you forgot, he's in prison. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. You see how he starts off this passage with, We all know that I'm not there. So now I'm handing the responsibility over to you. Have you noticed how Paul says, listen, what I have been doing has been for your faith. And so now your faith, which I have given thanks for, and your faith that I, you have been sharing with other people, it is yours. There comes a certain level where the teacher has to say to the student, I've taught you what I can teach you. Now I need, you to get, I need you to practice this. As parents, maybe you know that, that feeling where you know, maybe you've, you've been teaching, your, you've been helping your child with, with a subject that they've really been struggling with, and the whole idea is there's going to come a time where I am not going to be with you to work through this problem with you. Or even if it's riding a bike, there's going to come a time where I can't follow behind you holding your seat because your friends are going to think that's really weird. And so now you have to take this ownership of this. And that's what Paul is doing. He says, I want you to work out your own salvation. And as I say that, I just said a word that could be qualified as what we might call Christianese, which means a language or a word that is very, very common in the church that maybe people outside the church don't know what that means. Or if they have heard of it, maybe there's an understanding of it that maybe isn't quite right. So what is Paul talking about when he says, work out your salvation? We've already talked about what it means for us to be worthy of the gospel and what that means and as well as what that doesn't mean. So what does it mean for the church in Philippi to work out their salvation? And we have to be very careful when we understand these Christianese words that we throw around that sometimes we assume we know what they mean, but maybe, maybe we've kind of seen half the picture. So when the Apostle Paul says, work out your salvation, we need to be careful because this is not an issue where sometimes people pit the idea of faith versus works together. They, they sort of see them as 
maybe mutually exclusive things. Like, if you have faith, in, then you should never work because if it's just based off faith, why are you doing any type of work? Or maybe they, they see this as a, okay, God has brought you this far. Now it's your turn to put forth the effort to sort of earn and keep God's love. I think a lot of us may, you know, if we were to be honest, say, yeah, I, I feel like my heart kind of goes in one of those two camps. Well, if it's by faith, then I don't have to do anything. Or, yeah, it's by faith, but I also have to, I have to work to, to sort of keep and earn God's love. You know, maybe subconsciously believe that way, or maybe we've even been taught that. But that's not what this is about when he says, work out your salvation. Because if that were the case, where it is, yeah, God brought you this far, but now you have to add your works to sort of get yourself over the finish line, then it wouldn't be by grace. And we've been learning all throughout Philippians and Ephesians that it's been by grace that you have been saved. You, don't, you haven't earned this, but rather God freely gives it to you. So if that's were the case, then it wouldn't be by grace. So that's not what it means. And also... It's not what it means because this isn't a command just for individual Christians to apply in their individual lives. Rather, this is a command that has been given to the entire congregation. That when they read this, it is, a, it is this, this command for all of you together should work out your salvation. And third of all, the reason why they're not pitting against each other faith versus works, because if we understand if we begin our understanding of working out our own salvation as some sort of works versus faith, then we've misunderstood what the Bible is talking about when the Bible talks about God's salvation. Because according to the Bible, God's salvation is God bringing us out of something and bringing us into something else. Bringing us out of something and leading us into something else. We saw in the book of Genesis about how God announced the gospel to Abraham, saying, I am going to bring your family, I'm going to grow your family so that you could be a blessing to the nations. I am bringing you out of something, and I'm giving you a new identity, a blessing to the nations. And then God rescues the nation of Israel, who he calls his son, out of slavery to bring them into the promised land. And so just very simply, for us to work out our salvation, it's not the works versus faith issue that sometimes people try and throw in there. That's not what this is about. But rather, this is an opportunity for us to bring out of ourselves, the very thing that God has given us. It's to bring out what God has done in us for his purpose. So for us to work out our salvation is to bring out, bring out what God has put in us for his purpose. Which is why Paul says that even as you do this, understand that it is God who is working in you. The Bible several times will use um, gardening images to put forward this metaphor. It talks about how the word of God has been planted in you, or God's eternal life has been given to you. We think about James chapter 1. Humbly accept the word that has been planted in you. First Peter chapter 1. You have been born again, not of imperishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring work of God. So for us to work out our salvation means that as a gardener tills the land, pulls the weeds, creates an environment for what is on the inside to grow, so we are to also do that for the Spirit of God in us. Because for us, our salvation is, it's not simply for us to go and be with God when we die, which is sometimes all we think salvation is. But rather, salvation is the hope 
and the promise that God will come and restore this world so that he will live with us. The biblical hope of salvation is not for us to, go, to die and go and be with God, but rather the biblical view of salvation is that God will come and fix what is wrong with earth, and he will live with the people who trust him on this earth forever. And so for our salvation to be worked out, it's really about following Jesus through God's Spirit to show this world through, the, through God's Spirit what it is like when God lives with his people as a picture of what it is going to be like when Jesus comes back. So for us to simply say, I have faith, therefore I don't need to do anything, your faith will become stagnant and it will die. The mark of saving faith is not the ability for you to look back at one time and say, I prayed this prayer, therefore I'm fine, I don't need to do anything. But rather, the mark of saving faith is a life that demonstrates through God's Spirit that He is turning you into somebody who is more and more like Jesus. Which is an interesting thing because you realize the more and more you grow in your faith, you realize the more and more, oh my goodness, I really need God to continue his work because of all these areas in my life where I just feel like I'm falling short. And yet in Romans chapter 8, the reason why God allows all things in our life for our good is to turn us into people who are like Jesus. And that is what Paul tells his church to do. So for us... To believe in Jesus is ultimately a call for us to trust him and follow him. To trust him and not to follow him is not to trust him. It is to trust and follow Jesus. So what does this look like? Paul goes on to say, Therefore do everything without grumbling and complaining. And immediately all of us should get really uncomfortable when we hear that. Because isn't it just, you know, for the lack of a better word, isn't it fun to grumble and complain? I mean, when something goes wrong, so is that what that means? You know, we, we should never complain, we should never do anything? We know what it's like to be around somebody who complains all the time. Whether you're on a long road trip and the kids keep saying, are we there yet? Or you're with your coworker and all they can do is talk about how management just doesn't get them. There kind of comes a point where you're just like, enough, I get it. This is no fun. But for you to continue to point out how bad this is, it only makes it worse. And we also, maybe some of us know that there are physiological effects to a life that is centered around grumbling and complaining. It actually rewires how your brain works if you only focus on the negative. Your blood pressure gets messed up. Your, you know, per, you know attitude affects your body. And so for the Apostle Paul to say, do everything without grumbling and complaining, is it just to be like, hey, you know what, this life is hard, but if we just focus on what... If we just focus on the bad stuff, it's not going to make anything better. It's just going to make this road trip go longer. Is that all he's saying? We're all in this together, so let's just try and have a good time. Or is there more to grumbling and complaining? He says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Paul has just got done instructing his church to serve one another as if they were if the person sitting next to you was the most important person in the world. To do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather consider the needs of the other person more important than you. How many minutes would go by before they realized, well, that's really hard? How many seconds does it take of serving somebody, looking out for the needs of somebody else? How many seconds have to go by before you realize, well, what if they don't do the same for me? What, what if I put their interests above my own, but nobody puts my interests over theirs. 
And I think some of us, may, maybe we're in life situations like that. Maybe it's a family situation or a work situation or a school situation. We're hanging out with our friends, and you know, we're the one who always does something, but nobody ever does anything for us. And so there kind of comes a point in our life where you know, maybe we're, we're serving somebody, but the entire time we're, we're complaining about it, and we want that person to know, yes, I'm serving you, but I sure am inconveniencing you for this, or I'm inconveniencing myself for this. Even if we don't say that out loud, internally we know. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a situation at home where you know, one, it, maybe one spouse feels like they're doing more than their share of the work. And as they're doing whatever it is, they think to themselves, well, when's the other person going to chip in? So as the church is faced with the immediate reality that serving other people doesn't always go the way that you think it should, and our immediate response is to therefore start to grumble and complain about it, and Paul realizes that, which is why he says, do it all without grumbling and complaining, we have to ask ourselves, well, then what does it mean then for us to never grumble, for us to never complain, for us to never, like, grumble is that great word where it sounds, I don't remember what that's called, but where the word sounds like what it actually is. You know, when you try and turn your car over and it doesn't quite go, grumble. What does it mean? What, what does it not mean? Well, I think what we first of all have to understand is that grumbling and complaining is not the same thing as pointing out something that is wrong in this world. Grumbling and complaining is not the same thing as lamenting or feeling sorrow or sadness. Grumbling and complaining is not the same thing as telling somebody how they've hurt you or saying that something is wrong. All throughout the Bible, we see people who have a prophetic voice the ones who are able to step into situations, whether it's a social situation or a relational situation, and say, this is not right. What you are doing is not right. Would it be fair for somebody to say, you should do all things without grumbling and complaining? That would be a misapplication of what that means. Similarly, it is not the same thing, again, as the lamenting of just crying out and saying, how long, O oh Lord, how long will people cry out? And we think about all of the situations of violence, even the prophets asking, God, these people are for violence. How much longer are you going to put up with that? And even when we read the Psalms, we see very realistic emotions that come through as people complaining about life. And I guess a question that we would have to ask ourselves is even as we deal with those realistic things that can actually be good for us, pointing out what is wrong, the real question then becomes, what do we do with those complaints? Where do we bring them? Do we bring them before God? Do we bring them before God and say, God, we don't understand why this is going on, but we trust you enough with them? That is not grumbling and complaining. But rather, grumbling and complaining is like that Old Testament pinata that once you hit it, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of stories from the Old Testament come spilling out. We think about the nation of Israel, Exodus and Leviticus, about how they, as soon as they were out of slavery, started complaining about a lack of food and a lack of water. Now, put yourself in their shoes. You are in the hot, dry climate. And if you don't have water, that's a real serious situation. It's not that they're spoiled. They're experiencing real life difficulty. But rather what they do is they start to complain. So much so that in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 32, just as Moses is kind of, he's about to die, and he's recapping the story of Israel, he says in Deuteronomy 32, Israel has become the crooked generation. The Lord saw this and rejected them because he was angered by his sons and daughters. I will hide my face from them, he said, and see what their end will be, for they are the perverse generation, children who are unfaithful. 
he goes on to say that they made me jealous by what is no God and angered me by their worthless idols. I will make them envious by those who are not a people. I will make them angry by a nation that has no understanding. You see, at the root of this problem isn't just the fact that people are sort of, you know, naturally responding to adverse situations by pointing out, hey, this is hard. This, this is hard. But rather, what they're doing is in their grumbling and their complaining, they're actually forgetting how God has rescued them in the past, and their grumbling and complaining has led them into idolatry, where they have rejected the God who has saved them in favor of the gods of the other nations. They've given themselves over to the idols of other nations. And when they did that, they started to engage in immorality because they have rejected gods and the, the, the God of Israel in their heart and started worshiping other idols, putting their trust in something else. It led them into wickedness. And that's the problem that we all have. It's not just that we don't follow certain rules, but rather we all reject God in our own ways. And we all worship and trust something more than him. And that's where the real problems come in our life, about how our idolatry, choosing God, something other than God to place our trust in, and even choosing, let, let, let's make this relevant, Choosing to bring our complaints to something else and expecting them to fix it rather than God is idolatry. Bringing our complaints, our hurts, our needs, our desires, and expecting them to fulfill them, that is what idolatry is. And it doesn't have to be a little carved statue. It could be a stack of green bills. It could be the approval of our coworkers because we just got another three letters put after our name. We're all guilty of it. And so Paul says, do all things without grumbling, complaining. Because in, later on in Philippians chapter 4, he's going to say, God is going to be able to provide all of your needs. So don't grumble and complain because when you do that, you forget how God has cared for you in the past. I think sometimes what happens is that we, our, our natural default attitude is to, when we grumble and, be, and we complain, it's because nobody understands what it's like to be us, right? Nobody, nobody does what we do. Nobody uh, experiences the rejection that we do. And so we immediately, we grumble against God because we think, oh, man, nobody knows what it's like. But here's a question. What would we do with our grumbling and complaining if we knew that God himself has experienced everything that we have experienced. In the person of Jesus, we see in the book of Hebrews about how Jesus was made like us in every way. He was fully God as well as fully man. He experienced everything we experienced. And because of that, the book of Hebrews says, it says that Jesus is able to sympathize with us and to show us compassion and to give us grace. You know, there's a big difference between complaining to people because we feel like nobody understands us, and there's a bigger di and there's a difference between that versus bringing our complaints to somebody who knows exactly what it's like to be us. Isn't that isn't that true that when we're working together with a group of people and we're all experiencing the same thing, there's a natural tendency for us to be like, "Can you believe what's going on?" What can you believe that God is actually inviting us to do that, to bring our complaints to him? Because Jesus knows exactly what it's like to be us, and that when we bring our complaints to him, it actually is a way of saying that we trust him enough to do what is right with them. And we're also called in many ways to do that with each other as well, to bear one another's burdens so we don't feel like we're alone. Hebrews chapter 12 says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, so don't give up. Hebrews chapter 10 says, don't stop going to church, because when you do, you're isolating yourselves. And all of a sudden, you're going to start to think, nobody knows what it's like to be me. Well, maybe they do. And the reason why you feel like nobody knows what it's like to be you is because you're not around other people. And maybe when you are around people, you're not telling them how you feel. 
Or maybe the other people don't feel like they can actually share too because we're all, so content, we're all so insistent on keeping ourselves so buttoned up that we don't allow our true fe our fears and our hurts and our hopes to be known. So we'd rather just grumble and complain about it. Now I know that for many people, that's all well and good and so many of us are asking, yeah, that's fine, but what about application? What, what do I do about that? If my natural default tendency is to complain about something, what should I do? And I know that this is one of those areas where I always struggle with in preaching just to give you application. So I, I stepped outside of my comfort zone today and get ready because I'm giving you sp specific application on how to engage your senses to replace grumbling and complaining with something else. Because we know in our life, our heart, our mind, our affections only have so much room. And if we fill them up with good things, then maybe grumbling and complaining aren't going to have as much of a foothold as possible. So engage your senses by remembering to taste and see that God is good. We sang taste and see from Psalm 34. We're reminded that Jesus tells us to pray, Father, give us this day our daily bread. And in the Proverbs, it says, God, don't make me too rich and don't make me too poor, because if I'm too rich, I'm going to forget about you, and if I'm too poor, then I'm going to be so worried about some finding food that I'm going, to, I'm going to forget about you. So just take moments throughout the day, you know, we call it being present, to look around and to give thanks for the things that you see. And then ultimately, realize that taste and see is something that God actually gives us of himself. When we take communion, we are able to taste and to see the picture of the body and blood of Jesus as a reminder that God has given us everything we need in him. So taste and see. Change your speech. Remember in Psalm 40, the psalmist, even as he's faced with all of these, these problems, is saying, I will tell of God's faithfulness among the great congregation. In Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Galatians, it says, when you speak, make sure that your words are life-giving rather than destroying. Do all things with a sense of thankfulness. And remember, in Psalm 77, how God has been merciful to you in the past. Psalm 77 is a great psalm because the psalmist is just in the depths of of despair, and he brings him back to, himself back to this moment. He says, I have to remember, has the Lord forgotten to be merciful? Has he forgotten how to show compassion? I will remember how God has shown up in the past to strengthen me while I wait for him in the future. So when we take seriously, and again, this, this is not something where you, if you just plug X into Y, like if you just do these things, I think sometimes what happens is that when, when pastors and preachers give applications, we sort of guarantee the results. This is not a, if you just do X, Y, and Z, your life will be free from grumbling and complaining. Your heart and mind are engaged in a lifelong battle for what you choose to do with your complaints for your heart's affections. This is a lifelong battle that you're called to do, not by yourself, but with other people. To taste and see, to change your speech, to remember what God has done. And the outcome of this is that you will be children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Last week and the weeks before, we learned that when the world sees a group of united followers of Jesus, despite all of their differences, where they may disagree with each other about things, the fact that they are stuck together in love and unity, that is when they realize that Jesus is for real. And the same thing here, that when the world sees that Christians love and serve one another without grumbling, without complaining, without keeping score, without having the tally of how come this person didn't do it for me, then we are the children of God without fault. I'll just quickly point out that in verse 19 through 30, the Apostle Paul gives two examples of shining stars of children, Timothy and Epaphroditus. 
And on your own today, go ahead and read that and notice the genuine emotions that are in that passage. We, I, won't, I won't focus on that too much right now. But the genuine emotions, genuine concern, anxiety, great joy, sorrow upon sorrow, genuine emotions that followers of Jesus experience. But where is this all leading to? It goes on to say in the second, pa- second part of the passage where it says, if we can go to the next slide. Then you will shine like them, like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life, and I will be able to boast on the day of Christ Jesus that I did not run, the, I did not run or labor in vain. So as we approach the last part of this message, the, the theme of the return of the king, we see where this is all going. And again, think of that pinata that as soon as you hit it in the right spot, everything comes spilling out. He says, you will shine like stars. And some of us might be thinking, oh, then, then we're, we're fulfilling our role as children of Abraham, a light, a, bl- a light to the nations, a blessing to the nations. And yes, that's true. And, and we're fulfilling what Jesus has said about how we are the light of the world, a city on a hill. So when we don't grumble and we complain, we're, we're fulfilling our created purpose. And yes, that's true. But it's not just an issue of doing what we have been created to do, but it's also, also a picture of our future. All throughout the history of God's people, from the Old Testament all the way until now, there are many times where we ask ourselves, is this really worth it? Is everything that we are doing in vain? Especially for people who are suffering for their faith. So when the Apostle Paul says this word of shining like stars, what he is actually doing is he's going back to the book of Daniel. And he brings up two chapters specifically. In chapter 7 and chapter chapter 12. In chapter 7, he paints this picture about how how there's this cosmic battle where he pictures these these governments as beasts. Beasts are fighting and they're warring. And then all of a sudden, out of almost nowhere, comes someone that they call the Son of Man. And the Son of Man, who later on in that chapter is described as God's faithful people who did not give in, who stood up in the face of persecution, who believed and trusted in God rather than going after the gods of the other nations. It's to these faithful people God brings up and seats at his right hand. And it says that the dominion of this Son of Man, the faithful people of God, their dominion will be over all the earth, and they will rule forever. And then in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel shows this picture of what happens at what we would call the end of the age, the end of the world, where God raises everybody. God resurrects everybody for judgment. And Daniel says, there will be such a time of distress that has never happened until now. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and contempt. Those who are wise will rise like the brightness of the heavens. Some translations say, they will rise and shine like the bright stars. And those who lead many to righteousness will be like stars forever and ever. You see, the Apostle Paul, even as he's writing, he, writing Philippians, he, he knows this question of, is it all really worth it? I mean, think about the early followers of Jesus, a crucified Messiah, the one who is supposed to rescue Israel, and the one through whom God is going to bring peace and justice, and through who, through who the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. A crucified Messiah? dead? It's all been in vain. But 
because of the way that God shows that he has vindicated Jesus and said it is through the resurrection of Jesus that even though in the darkest moments where it seems like evil and injustice has won over righteousness, the resurrected Jesus proves that our faith and our work in God is not in vain. Even then, even in times where it may cause us to put our grumbling and complaining on the altar at the foot of the cross and say, God, I know what is going on is not right. And even these things that are not right, they displease you as much as they displease me even more. Still, I am trusting in you and I will choose to love and to serve and to consider the needs of other people more than myself. The resurrected Jesus and the promise of our resurrection show that it is not in vain. And so we are no longer slaves of fear if this has all been worth it, but rather we are children of the resurrected Christ who will one day be raised and shine like stars when Christ returns. In the next chapter, the Apostle Paul, again, when he is he's drawing that comparison to, listen, everybody in Philippi is so concerned that, oh, we are a Roman colony. We're so proud of where we live. The Apostle Paul says, but you, you need to realize that your citizenship is in heaven, which sometimes we interpret as, oh, so the real hope is when I die and get to go and be in heaven wherever, and I'll go to this disembodied space. But that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says about where our home is. It says our home is in heaven from which we await a Savior, the return of the crucified king is our hope that when Jesus comes back, we too will be raised and our lowly bodies will be transformed to be like his glorious body. That is the salvation that we are called to work out together so that we know this has not been in vain. We do not have to be slaves to fear, but rather sons of God who will be raised. Let's pray together. And then we're going to sing uh, the chorus at the second half of the song, No Longer Slaves. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even as we are reminded of your call to not grumble or complain, we know that that starts to fly in the face of everything that our natural senses of what is right and wrong, it challenges that. So help us to lay those things at the foot of the cross as a sign of our faith and trust that you are able to do what is right with the things that cause us that pain. And help us to continue to follow Jesus in the way that we love and serve one another as the way that we love and serve and worship you. We thank you that through faith we are not slaves to fear, but we are children of God. Amen.